on stage today. We're very grateful. Today we get to read <clears throat> from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. <clears throat> now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. Two, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And two, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And two, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Thank you, Mark. Well, we're continuing to uh, prepare our hearts for, for the celebration of the birth of Christ. And obviously the arrival of, of the Messiah is the whole point of, of Advent. And so I'd like to read for you one, one other short verse that, that I think kind of rides along with this passage in, in Ephesians chapter 4 that Mark has just read for us. It comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. It's, it might be very familiar to many of you. It's often read uh, around this time of year because it's a, a prophecy. It's part of a larger prophecy that speaks about the coming of the Messiah. It says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. That was actually part of the reading um, that the children's family read for us at the beginning of the service. Isaiah is, is one of the Old Testament prophets, and he, he wrote and spoke hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. But he doesn't just describe the context or I'm sorry, he doesn't describe the context of, of the birth of the Messiah as this big celebrative event. He doesn't describe it as, as a context of, of gladness and, and joy. He really describes it the opposite way. He said, this light has come to people who are walking in darkness. People who, who are living in darkness in deep darkness. And it's to them that he will go on and say that a child has been born, a son has been given. And if you think about it, this is consistent with the circumstances around the birth of Jesus. Because Jesus wasn't born into fanfare. He wasn't born into a celebration. He was actually born into obscurity. He was born into struggle. He was born to this, this young Jewish couple whose people had been displaced by Roman occupation. Many of the people of their day were, were calling out to God for deliverance from what they believed to be oppression from these Gentile, this Gentile government. Jesus was born at the end of an exhausting journey much of which had Mary riding on the back of a donkey. There's no real lodging to speak of. You know, very famously, we say there is no room in the inn. And so the circumstances are not very glamorous. They're not very joyful. It's the middle of the night. And so here's what's so amazing about the birth of Jesus. 
His arrival is completely consistent with his purpose. His purpose was not to come as a conquering king. He didn't come as part of a parade, although one day he will. But, but the time he has come, the time that we're celebrating here, that was not as a conquering king. He came into the world, a world that is broken by sin and death and suffering. He entered into that brokenness, into that suffering, even to the point of death. Because you really can't talk about the birth of Christ without also being mindful of the death of Christ, right? I mean, when Jesus was born on that first Christmas, there wasn't necessarily a sense of his death. But we've been celebrating Christmas now for over 2,000 years, and we know that Jesus was born to die. So you can't really, can't, can't really talk about his birth without thinking about his purpose, which was to die. God has heard our calls. God has seen the struggle of this world, and his response is that he has come to be with us. Think about this. God did not come as, as a suburban inner city missionary, you know, where you, where you come in for the afternoon and you do some work and you clean up the neighborhood and then it's starting to get dark and then we go back to the Marriott. That's not the way that God has come to us. God has come to us. He's come to live with us. He entered into our darkness, and He came to deliver us and to bring us into the light. And so today, what the Apostle Paul is having us look at is actually to, to meditate a little bit on our darkness. And I know that doesn't sound like good news, but if you don't understand the darkness, then you don't really understand what Jesus came for. And it's hard for us to understand our need of his coming. And so we're looking today at Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. And, and in this, I think Paul is teaching us something that is very important for our understanding of the Christian life. He's saying that the Christian life is an exchanged life. He's not saying... You know, the Christian life is add Jesus to whatever you have. You know, you got all this collection of stuff in your life, all these things that you're hoping in, all these things that you're trusting in, and you just add Jesus to it and it makes everything fine. He actually says, when Jesus comes into your life, he comes in and he replaces things. So he talks about it like this. He says, put on the new, put off the old. He says, bring in the new, but put the old out. Because when Jesus comes in, he doesn't just come in as an addition. He comes in as a replacement. We're exchanging the old for what is new. It appears that in many ways, Paul is describing something that for his, his original readers, this is, there are things that are already happening in their lives. But they may not even be aware of it, and Paul is, is helping them to understand what's been going on. Maybe you've experienced this too. Have you ever experienced something in your life where, where you, you, you know that God has been doing something in your life, but you're, you're, you're not really aware of it, you're not really attentive to it, until you get to a point where you kind of look back on something in your life and you say, wow, look, look, look what has changed since then. Look how my life is different from what it was at that point, to what it is now. Why does that happen? It happens because God's working, because God's doing something. But we, we are often unaware of it because, you know, we, we are living our life every day. It's like when you see kids, you know, kids are growing, and you see kids every day, and somebody says, oh my, how, how big your, your, your son or your daughter has gotten, and you think, really, they're kind of the same as they were yesterday. But somebody who hasn't seen them for three months, they notice it. Well, this, these are the kind of things that are going on in the lives of the Ephesians. And Paul is describing for them and for us what God has been doing. And so he first describes the old self. It's like he's saying, remember what you used to be like? Remember what you were like when you were shorter, <laughs> when you were younger, when you were less spiritually mature or less spiritually alive? And so 
So this isn't true, just true for the Ephesians, it's true for us too. This is a description of our old selves as well. And it's basically a description of the darkness, the darkness of our world, the darkness of our lives, but, but particularly it's the darkness of our hearts. He's not just saying, look, you used to be short and now you're tall. He's, he's really describing growth and change that has happened in our hearts. He's saying, so, so he describes what our hearts used to be like. And as he does this, he essentially gives us two categories, two categories of, of, of description of the darkness of our heart. First of all, he, he talks about the futility of our minds, and then he talks about the, this, this idea that we are given over to sensuality. And so I want to talk with, with you a little bit about that today. So, so the, the futility, let's start with the futility of our minds. And, and when he talks about the futility of our minds, he really lays out three aspects of the futility of our minds. They're all found, all three of them are found in verse 18. So if you, if you have your scriptures, just follow along. You can see this unfold in verse 18. The first aspect of the futility of our minds that Paul talks about, he says, that we, are, we were darkened in our understanding, darkened in our understanding. Paul seems to be saying that our ability to perceive reality was tainted. It's not that we can't see anything, but it's, it's tainted. Our vision is dark. It's like we were walking around in dim light. The older I get, the worse my eyesight becomes. And so when I was young, you could throw a piece of paper with very small print and no light at all, and I could read it for you. But now you throw that fine print in front of me and there's not much light in the room, I just hand it back to you and say, you can't hold this far enough away from me so that I can see it. Because I need light. Some of you have experienced... The, the, dra- the dramatic change of having a cataract repaired. It's sort of like that. You know, if you, if you know anyone who's, who's had cataracts and you've had, they've had them repaired, they get a new lens. And, and, you, t- and you listen to them describe their experience. It's, it's almost instantaneous. The, the, the cataracts are sort of a clouding of your eyes. And so over time... The colors are less vivid. White, in particular, is, is a dramatic one because little by little, it's like the frog in the kettle. But someone who has cataracts, they really don't see white anymore. White shows up as sort of a yellow color. But when they get it repaired, one of the things that they almost all say is, oh my goodness, look how white this is. Because they've been seeing everything that, that's in that, that, that family of colors, they just see it as yellow. Paul is saying that there are, there are things that we think we understand because we're looking at them. We see them. We think we see them clearly. But he's saying that's not their true color. You're darkened in your understanding. That's not the true meaning. That's not the true perspective. So that's the first aspects of the futility of our minds. We are darkened in our understanding. The second aspect that he highlights for us is he talks about how we are alienated from God. We're, or, or we're alienated from the life and the relationship that, that God desires, that may, he made us to have with him, and therefore we're alienated from the life that God made us to be living. We're far from God, and because we're far from God, we aren't experiencing the life that we were made to live. It's, it's like God is our operating system, to kind of use the, the com- computer a- analogy. But when you, when you get out of touch with your operating system, when your operating system becomes unstable, then your, the platform of your life becomes unstable. And so we're, we're trying to run these programs, we're trying to run all these apps in our life, but they're not working properly. Why? Because we're disconnected from the operating system. And so there are things in our lives that are not going the way they're supposed to go. Why? Because we're disconnected from, from the one who made us, the one who is, that we are designed to have him at the center of our life. 
So we're alienated from God. And then thirdly, he says, he talks about the hardness of our heart. And really, he says, the hardness of our heart is actually the cause of these other two things. He says that our, the darkened understanding and our alienation from God all comes at, from the root, which is the hardness of our heart. It's the ultimate cause of, of our alienation from the God who made us. It's the ultimate cause of the darkness of our understanding. Because in our fallen state, in our natural state, the way we're born into this world, we are not alive to God. We're unresponsive to Him. We have hearts of stone, the Bible says in other places. This is why he says we have hard hearts. But it's also the foundation of what Paul says next about our condition, because after he talks about the futility of our minds, he goes on to say that we are given to sensuality. And this, this, this aspect of our lives, of our nature that is given to sensuality, is connected to the hardness of our hearts. And here's how. In verse 19, he says, they have become callous and they have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Here's what, here's what he's saying. He's saying the natural fallen condition of our hearts is hardness. It's numbness. And think about numbness for a minute. We are, if, if we're hard toward God, and Paul says we lack perspective, we lack the ability to see clearly, but at the same time, he says that we, we desperately desire to feel. We want to feel. So what do we do? Well, typically, we give ourselves to the pursuit of feeling good, don't we? We want to feel good. We want to feel happy. We want to, happy, we want to feel fulfilled. And so the majority of the time, we pursue good things to make us feel. And we'll do almost anything to feel these things because our, our numb hearts want to feel good. That's why we pursue so many of the things that we pursue. I mean, think about life in the Western world. We are all about the pursuit of feeling good, of feeling happy. We've even kind of baked it into the way we talk about why our country exists. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of feeling good. It's almost, we make it our right, because if we say, well, if it's a right, then that means you owe it to me. We want it desperately. But think about this as well. When people get tired of feeling nothing, of feeling numb. Sometimes we just get desperate to feel something. And sometimes feeling something is better than feeling no nothing, even if that something is pain. Have you ever thought about that? That for some people, they are so weary from being numb that they just want to feel something. And so feeling pain is better than nothing. Do you understand that this is where some forms of self-harm come from? I want to feel something. Because feeling something makes me feel more alive than I do right now. Even if feeling something, that, that's something that I want to feel is pain. It's where, where many aspects of promiscuity come from. We can argue and we can present all the rational reasons for why promiscuity is unhealthy, can't we? We can lay out the whole argument for why promiscuous relationships are unhealthy, they're not good for you, they only lead you down a road to, to harm and despair and emptiness, right? And yet, people continue to pursue it over and over and over again. Why? I think in many ways, it's because it's an opportunity to feel something and not nothing even though they know it will lead to pain. I think it's where many addictive behaviors come from. Again, I want to feel something because feeling nothing is exhausting. 
The solution is not to feel more. The solution is not, give me more to feel. Pile on the experiences. Pile on the, the, the affect. The solution is that we need God to do surgery on our hearts. To remove the numbness. This is why, why he says, Paul says, we need to put on new life. We need something new. We need something from outside ourselves. He says, put on new life. Put off the old life with its hard heart, with its alienation from God, with its darkened understanding, and put on new life in Jesus Christ because that's what we're made for. You want to feel what you were made to feel? Invite Jesus Christ to be the center of your life. Bring your life. Take, take the old things that you value, all the things you've been pursuing, and set them over here and bring Jesus Christ into the center. Invite Him to, to, to allow Him to, to direct the purposes and the ends of your life. That's what you're made for. Well, how do we do that? Well, this is what the rest of the message is about. And this is not just for people who aren't Christians. I think, I think there are almost as many Christians who struggle with how to do this. Right? I mean, we, we say, look, I, 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 I thought I have invited Jesus into my life. I'm trying. Come on, Dan, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to put him at the, at the center of my life. I'm trying to not pursue all these feelings out here in the world. And I'm trying to experience life the way that I was made to live it. Well, from here, I think Paul gives us four, four ideas, four points that I think we can, we can kind of take into our personal lives. The first one, and these are gonna, these, we're building something here, and so the first couple will may feel very simplistic. But the first one is this. It requires a decision. It requires that we make a decision. The fact that Paul continues to repeat this refrain of put off and put on, it implies that it's something we have, to, we have to participate in. It indicates that we are called to respond to these truths about the old life and about the new life. I, I don't want to overemphasize this as if we could rescue ourselves. I don't think that's the point. But, but there is something here that Paul is saying. He says, put it on. There's something new here. There's something, this new life in Christ. He's saying, put it on, bring it in. And there are these old things. There's old parts of our life. And he says, you got to put it out. You got to take it off. So there is something for us to pursue here. So it starts with a decision. Secondly, it requires an inside change. It requires a change in our hearts. In other words, this new life is not just behavior. It's not just, well, take some new activities or take some new behaviors and then just kind of staple them onto your life. In fact, it doesn't even start with behavior. If you, I, I don't have it to show you on the screen, but if you, if you have a Bible that's open to Ephesians chapter 4, what you'll notice is that verse 25 and what comes after it comes after 17 to 24. And I'm not just, you know, master of the obvious, verse 25 comes after verse 24. What I'm, what I'm really saying is the things that he talks about from verses 25 on are based on what he has said in 17 to 24. What's he saying? Well, this is what he says in, 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 in those verses. He says, therefore, having said everything that, I, that I've just said to you, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth. That's a behavior, right? But you don't, you don't, you don't speak the truth until the inside heart change has happened. The speaking the truth is an outward manifestation of the inward change. So speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Another behavior, be angry but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give opportunity to the devil. Let the thief, and, and he goes on another one. 
Don't steal. Let the thief stop stealing. That's a behavior. But, but the thief isn't going to... Some of you have seen that, you know, I would encourage you, go on YouTube and, and just uh, search Bob Newhart, Stop It. Okay? Some of you have seen it. Many of you haven't. Bob Newhart's an old show. But, but it's, it's sort of a hilarious little skit because he's a therapist. And you know what his strategy is? All of his patients come in and he gives them two words. Stop it. As if they're going to change their lives by external behavior. That's why it's, that's why it's funny. Because we look at that and we say, that's not going to work. That's right. It's not going to work. Because changed lives don't start with behavior. They end with behavior. They result in different behavior. But it starts with an inside change. That's what we need. It's not that behavior makes us a Christian. It doesn't. But being a Christian starts with recognizing the darkness of our heart. The darkness of our understanding that we're far from God, that we're numb, that our hearts, our hearts are hard. That God's response to our problem is that in Jesus, He has come to us. That He entered our dark world, and that He is offering us new life. And this new life does not come from the outside in, but it starts on the inside and it works its way out. It starts with a changed heart. So just very practically, what do you think would happen if your prayer, if your primary prayer to God became, Lord, would you change my heart? Would you take my old heart of stone, my old heart that is darkened in my understanding, that is, that is distant from you, would you take that heart and put it out and give me a new heart where you are at the center, where you are the King of kings, where you are the Lord of lords, and I am seeking to follow you in every area of my life. Inside change. The third point is that it then leads to a new way of thinking. Verse 23 says, This new life involves being renewed in the spirit of our minds. See, that, that renewal, that, that, that heart change, one of the first results of that heart change is that we begin to think differently. We begin to understand differently. We begin to value things differently. As God renews our hearts, we are no longer hard-hearted. We are no longer darkened in our understanding, and so we begin to see more clearly. It's like the, the, the person who gets their cataract repaired, and you say, oh, that's what white looks like. A huge part of this is what we might call our personal epistemology. Now, there's not going to be a quiz on that. You don't have to remember that. But epistemology is how we know what we know. It's, it's how we know what is right. It's how we know what is true. And so our personal way of knowing begins to change. And a large part of our renewed mind is that more and more, we are allowing God's Word to be what informs what we know. How do you know what is right? Internet? Friends? Family? I'm not saying that those things are all horrible, but they're all over the place. More and more, Paul says, to, to have this new life is to allow God's Word, the Scriptures, to be the most authoritative, the most weighty source of truth in our lives. This is, this is where there tends to be a correlation between our familiarity with God's Word and the renewal in our thinking. It's not to say you have to read your Bible X amount of time every day, and that's how you know if you're a good Christian. That's not the point. The point is, how much do you want your renewed mind to be enlightened by the Scriptures? If you don't 
if that doesn't matter to you, well then keep doing what you're doing if you're not reading the Bible very much because you'll continue to get that result. But if you want your mind to be renewed, if you want this new life to more and more characterize who you are, well then there's a direct correlation to how much God's Word is at the center of what informs you. So, it requires a decision, it requires an inside heart change, which leads to a new way of thinking, which is grounded in God's Word. And then fourthly, the new life requires an all-out new pursuit. In other words, this new life really brings with it an entirely new purpose for your life, an entirely new mission for your life. This is, this is all in, in verse 20, and, and, he, and he says something very interesting. Paul says, talking about this old way of living, he says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. And if you think about it, at least, at least to my sensitivities, that's a very unnatural way to speak. Like if I'm introducing you to somebody, if I want to introduce you to my wife, I would say, oh, have you learned Sandy? It's kind of an odd way to say it, isn't it? We would, I would say, have you been introduced to, right? Or have you met? But Paul says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Because you learn a subject, right? You learn how to play a game. You learn how to do things. But Paul, Paul says that Jesus is not just information. Jesus is not just a skill, And so he takes this construct of learning and he applies it to Jesus. Jesus is not just a teacher. You don't just learn from him. You learn him. That he has entered into our brokenness and into our struggle to be with us in it. That he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he took our sin upon himself. He willingly went to the cross to atone for our sins, to remove the distance between us and the God who made us that caused the hardness of our heart. He took it all. He took it all away from us. Do you see that he really is the Lord of life? That's why you don't just add him. See, if you just add him to everything that, that we already are, then you're just saying that Jesus is one among many. He's just kind of like everything else in my life. I just need a little bit more of Him. It's very different to say that He is the Lord of life. That He doesn't just come into our lives as, as one interest among others. He comes into our lives as the one who is supreme, who is at the center. He sits on the throne of my life such that all of the other areas of my life find their perspective around Him. They find their meaning because they're connected to Him. And that brings new life more and more to bear in our lives. And so that's why Paul ends the way he does. He, he concludes by saying, so, let us put off the old self, which belongs to your former, for, former manner of life, which is corrupt through deceitful desires. But then he says, and then let us put on the new self, patterned after the likeness of Christ in true righteousness and true holiness. Would that we would pray that God would help us to put off the old and put on the new, to put Jesus at the center of our life, that our lives more and more would be characterized by righteousness and holiness. Would you pray with me for that? Father, this, is, this has been a message that's not been full of great news about where we come from, but it is true.